chapter 8, non-limited uh, message frame. Uh, well, there was one thing which keeps bothering me about uh, the way they have structured curriculum structures everywhere. That it sort of gives a fragmented picture of the courses and disciplines, you know. So you have physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics. Um, you learn all of it in a very fragmented way. This seems to give you a feeling that when you go out uh, to confront the real life problems and challenges, the problems are expected to come with labels on their head. I am a physics problem, I am a chemistry problem. Use chemistry to solve me, use material science to solve me. But as you know, that's not how the real life functions. Problems invariably require you to, you know, seek answers from across the discipline. And uh, of late, a paradigm has been gaining ground world over for the steam paradigm, which says that, you know, can we integrate science, technology, engineering, arts, A for arts, mathematics, to a curriculum? That's a tall order. Requires a lot of uh, fundamental overhaul. So I was actually trying to see if I can smuggle the notion of steam into a single class. <coughs> can I take a few representative problems from engineering and demonstrate that they, they, need, they require inspiration from a diverse set of disciplines, okay? So today you will see that you know, what you have learned in physics and biology and mathematics will all uh, come to life uh, in trying to address a few challenging problems, few, few challenging design principles, okay? So, but you know, before we get to that, let me pose a very simple problem in me. Okay, imagine, um, a D-shaped Y. Okay. And let us put two bits, two small bits, bits typically thread the wire, right? at this point, and believe that the wire is under gravity, so obviously these both weeds will slide down, right? <coughs> and this D, this arc of the D is not an ordinary arc, actually supposed to be a part of a circle. Okay? So which bead do you think will reach the bottom point fast? The straight line? Or the one which is and it's the current path. Now it turns out as, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, today I think there won't be much of a, because I have a lot of ground to cover. Typically I pose a question and I wait for you and then I take your answers and then I challenge your answers, right? Today we don't have that much of time. The point is, uh, those who answer that the straight wire will be the one which will win the race, tend to think that that's the shortest path. Those who tend to think that the curved path will win the race, uh, reason that because that is a steeper slope, it just goes down, so it will acquire a higher velocity and it will reach faster. What we are trying to minimize here is not the length but time. Okay. You heard this uh, word or idiom called the devil is in the detail? This innocuous looking problem actually is the genesis of lot of math and physics, calculus, came from this, okay, from a solution of such a problem. So in the late, uh, I think, 17th century, or uh, mid-17th century, some of the brightest minds in mathematics or natural philosophy were, as it was called at that time, uh, Bernoulli, the two Bernoulli brothers. Uh, one of the, the younger ones, uh, John Bernoulli, posed this challenge to the mathematicians across the Europe. The answer, and that the problem that he posed, he said that forget about this, you know, Given two points A and B, what is the curve that connects point A and B uh, such that the bead will reach the bottom in the minimum of time? Okay. So in so doing, he uh, opened a whole new field called the calculus of variation, and this problem is called the epistochrone problem. It's a Greek word, brekis meaning, brekis meaning shortest, and chron, as you know, is chronology, right? Time. So, uh, 
shortest time, the problem of shortest time. Okay, to find the shortest time. That is actually a problem in mechanics, right? But we boil down to finding, you know, finding a curve. <coughs> boil down to math, finding a curve that connects this, this two points which does it the shortest possible time. Now, for the time being, uh, let us forget about this problem. Let us look at something completely different. Optics. We will come back to this, okay? You have a light which enters from the rarer medium to a denser medium. So if the velocity of light is V1 here, we all know that actually uh, it does not continue to travel the straight, plus, straight, straight line as it was, but it deviates from that path, right? It makes an angle alpha 1 here, an angle alpha 2 here. Okay. So if this is point A and this is point B, what we want to understand is that, you know, what is the right path that connects point A and B for light? So a very simple exercise of, you know, finding light, it turns out, according to the uh, greatest... Uh, French Fermat, French mathematicians, said that, you know, if you try to find the time delta t that the light takes to travel from A to B, it will be this, this, suppose, you know, this is, this is point A, suppose this is point P and this is point B. So you look at this, so this AB, this distance is, this height is A and this length is X. And if this is C, then this is C minus X, right? So this delta T will be uh, square root of A squared plus X squared by V1, the time taken to cover this path, plus uh, this hypotenuse will be this squared plus this squared. This is C minus X, so this is B squared plus C minus X squared by V2 in general, right? I am just writing this. <coughs> now, Parma said that, you know, light does not bother about the <coughs> shortest path. It wants to minimize its time. It wants to get there fastest. Okay. So, it becomes a simple problem of minimization that you do dt by dx and equate it to zero. Okay. You find a condition I won't go to the map right now, I'll just show you that if you just follow this simple algebra, then sine alpha 1 by V1 is same as sine alpha 2 by V2. It turns out that this quantity sine alpha 1 by V1, this is nothing but your Snell's law. That you know the ratio of the sines of the angles are in direct proportion to the velocities of light in those two mediums, right? So this is your Snell's law. And it, you know, you obtain the solution by minimizing the time and this entire branch of calculus of variation actually sprung from this. And by the way, this problem was solved by both Newton and Leibniz and Bernoulli, they were the top mathematicians and they all actually cracked it um, and gave birth to the calculus and the calculus of variation. Okay, now the point is uh, when the light travels, you know, when the light travels the atmosphere, there is no distinction between one medium and two medium. You know, the index of refraction changes continuously. So it takes a continuously curved path. But the upshot here is that this quantity sine alpha by V stays constant. Okay. Now, coming to this problem of this you know, the shape of this arc, okay. If you look at any point and draw a tangent to it, okay, and if this is your uh, y and this is your x, okay, so this, this tangent is making an angle alpha with this y axis, an angle beta with x axis, Okay, then you can actually show that sine alpha is same as 
this is obviously cosine beta and cosine beta is same as 1 over sec beta and that is same as 1 over 1 plus tan square beta and tan beta is nothing but the slope here so this is nothing but 1 plus <coughs> dy by dx squared okay and now the velocity of the bead as it traverses the height y is this this wire is frictionless, so there is no dissipation, so it is just root 2 gy, right? So, given that the velocity is just root 2 gy, so if you connect these three equations and go to the grind of math, you come to the parametric equations that describe the right curve that takes the bead from point A to point B in shortest possible time. And you will be amazed to know what that curve is. Can anybody guess what that curve is? Cycloid. Cycloid, yes. It's a cycloid and the relation x and y, uh, uh, the there are two coordinates of a point, uh, x is uh, a, uh, a into theta minus sin theta and y is equal to a into 1 minus cos theta. I am skipping a lot of details here because details are not important right now. I mean you want to see the big picture right now. Okay. Where this you might you know I mean so there is a lot of things which have gone between here and here. I mean you know uh, the point is what is this a here. So this cycloid is a curve if you take a bicycle wheel and paint a point on at some point on the rim of a bicycle and trace the trajectory traced by that point is actually a cycloid. So the cycloid is generated by a wheel of radius A and this theta sitting out there is the angle by which it rotates. Okay. So the curve which connects this to point is a cycloid. The point is all this has come from the this so called calculus of variation and the uh, registrochrome problem. Why I am talking about registrochrome? What has it got to do with what I'm going to say now? Um, let me let me get something. Okay, la. This comes in handy. Don't tell the operator that I'm using mouse like this. Okay. So it's a wire. Okay, it's a wire. And I have okay. This is actually a very last time actually I brought the chain. Let us take a chain. Imagine a chain in my hand. Okay, I'm holding a chain at two points. You can even hold it at some random different points. Look at the shape of that chain. What is the shape of that chain? It's actually called a catenary. And even that catenary curve for the chain is obtained by this method. Okay. What has this catenary curve got to do with what we are trying to say right now? Let us get down to the oh, if I open the no, okay. Yeah, it's here already. It's here. Ah, yeah. Okay? So, with that, let me switch off the slides. Okay, uh, we are going to see a few problems and how, you know, uh, inspiration from different disciplines help us solve them. Okay, scheming to the boundaries of science, engineering. So, I am giving you an ultimate design challenge. Design something that is economical, strong, and weak as well, strong as well as weak depending upon the need. Okay, so you want it to be strong when you want it to be strong and you want it to be, it should be weak when you want it to be weak. It's a very paradoxical requirement. And it must synthesize economy, durability, strength. All apparently, if something is durable and uh, useful and beautiful, all of these things did not come together, right? So the point I want to write home is that we can actually come together. Uh, we will look at some examples, how all the disparate aspects of design they come to life in a few examples. Okay. This is a Roman bridge which was built 2000 years ago in the river Sajo in Spain in Alacantara. This thing is standing tall for 2000 years. There must be something about it that is stable, right? Look at the structure, it's an arch, right? 
And arches are ubiquitous. This does not have to be told. This Talani is full of arches, right? It's full of arches. Beautiful. It's beautiful, but it's not just beautiful. It's actually strong because there are evidence. All temples are arches. Mosques are arches. There is one element that unites temples and mosques, right? They're all arches, right? What is an arch? Is it a random arch? Or, you know, it follows some design principle. And if it follows some design principle, what is that? It's a specific curve called a catenary curve. So it's a revolution of a catenary curve. And catenary curves are again obtained by, I'll show you the expression, it's a hyperbolic cosine function. Okay. So it's a catenary curve. And chain actually, you know, it minimizes the, its potential. Okay. The way the shape it takes, it, takes, it minimizes the energy. Okay. And it enhances the stability. So these arches are very strong. This is a very uh, strong arch, 52 feet tall, tall, and has been standing for millions of years, right? So it is shaped by nature. So nature must know, you know, there is a lot to be inspired from nature because over the years, unnecessary elements have been thrown out, and whatever stands the test of time remains. So there is a lot to be learned from here. So arches are good. This is an arch. And we must understand why is arch so strong. So, uh, did I get this? Okay, yeah. So, look at this. You know, let me. I have painted a brick here. So, the shape of the brick is not exactly, you know, parallel. It will be like a trapezoid, right? Two arms will not be parallel because it's radially. So, if this brick is loaded from the top with force F, you can use the parallelogram law of force to resolve this F into two sideways forces F1 and F2. The upshot is. When such structures are loaded from the top, arch is an efficient way to transfer the load from where you don't want to sideways that it's okay to have them. Why? Because if it transfers the load from here to these two bricks, the same story will apply to this brick, they will transfer to this brick, they will transfer to this brick, and ultimately the load is transferred to the vertical pillars. And vertical pillars can, you know, extend those compressive forces from the right. So you can see that an arch is an efficient way of distributing the force across the bricks which take the load and ultimately transfer them to the vertical columns that it's okay to have them. There is a physical way of understanding why actually this works. This works because you see for this brick to tear loose from the structure, this top broader, the, 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 the wider part of the top has to be pushed through the narrower part of the bottom, right? So as it tries to do that, it invariably ends up pushing shoulders on the side, right? So you cannot, if this is L2, this is L1, you cannot expect this L2 to be accommodated in a smaller region. So obviously, you know, it cannot, okay? Now, if arches are strong, then we have this eggs, which are also an, which is also an arch, right? An egg is an arch. Uh, so, is there any evidence that eggs are strong? Now, actually, you know, uh, until the last semester, in this time, I could not do it. A, for the want of time, and B, the person whom I buy the eggs from, say, yes, stop selling the eggs. I did that at 8 o'clock, so I had no time to go to the market to get. I typically get a crate of eggs and put it here and ask some 70 odd kg student to stand on a crate of eggs. Okay? And I prove to you that this crate of eggs can stand the weight of a, luckily for me, at, uh, a couple of years ago when I, when I did that, some students shot the video of it and I put them on the social media. So uh, uh, somebody sent me that, you know, this video of your lecture has come on Facebook, so somebody sent it to me. So I have that, so although I don't have the credit of fact, but I actually have a video of the actual lecture where this actually happened. Sound? Sound? He said sound is working. Yeah. Anyway, you don't want to hear the sound. The video is good enough. So that's me, of course. X bought from Pilates, not from anywhere else. And in fact, then, you know, I asked there was one Mr. Bispilani who had a lot of muscles. So he said that, sir, I can break it with my arm. So I gave one egg to him. 
that fellow struggled and did a lot of sweat and all that. He said, I'll do it later. Okay, so the proof is that eggs are strong. And that's not a surprise because we have thin these hens who are, you know, spreading around and making a bust in the morning, right? If eggs would break, then there would be no hens to give more eggs, right? So nature has designed eggs so that they are strong. Now you break them in your home with a spoon. That's a very, you know, that's a pressure. You hit it hard. That's an impulse that you give. That's not same as try, go back and try breaking an egg with your palm. And I challenge you, if there are no cracks in it, you won't be, you won't succeed in that. Okay? Now I told you in the beginning of this challenge that you want to design something that is strong as well as weak at the same time. So if Mr. Bitspanani could not break the air, if a 70 kg student standing on the egg could not break the air, there is chicken inside the air which has not yet pumped its muscles and the poor kid has to come out. How does the chicken do that? And the flip side of the story is that the chicken is inside. We are outside. Okay? So you can see this, what is this? Something is strong from outside but not from inside, you know? Let us look at this story again. If you hammer this brick from the top, you have to try and accommodate the broader, wider part to the narrower part. But take a brick and hit it from the bottom. The narrower part has to go to the top. That's perfectly all right. It can happen. So, you, so you know, ours can be broken this way, but cannot be broken that way. And that's why those bridges, because gravity acts downwards, so bridges are safe. But if somebody, you know, decides and goes and hammers it from the below, then of course, you know, the bridge will come crashing down. So that's the story of air, that the chicken is inside and you are outside. So chicken can easily come out of the air, but, and this arc, the arc of the edge is a catenary curve. Okay? What's that catenary curve? If you solve the, uh, basically, you know, you can actually develop a differential equation for that. Which tension is a function of x, the x component of tension remains constant. We will not go into that direction right now. But the upshot is that the y as a function of x is a hyperbolic cosine. And this constant a, depending upon its value, the shape of the arch may look different. But it's ultimately a hyperbolic cosine. And this a will factor in the density of the rope or the tension, uh, the, the, the constant horizontal component of tension and the, and the surface cross section of the rope. All that will go into the constant A. Okay. And did I mention the A in the stream? From stem to stream, there is arcs. So you see all this architecture that you see, they employ this catenary curve. So there is math, there is physics, there is stability. And there is architecture. You know, it has to be aesthetically beautiful, right? So all the churches uh, across the world, this, by the way, uh, is the same we saw his famous uh, huge. I forgot the, I have seen this myself by the way, the same before you asked. So I think it is uh, some uh, 300 meters or so, the both, I mean the height and the width are same for the same, I'm sorry, in St. Louis, St. Louis, St. Louis, okay, in US. This is again a church. Now, since our childhood we have been learning this I is for igloo, right? And igloo, is a home of Inuit staying in the polar regions. And what is it that they used to build their homes? There are no bricks, there are no trees, there's nothing other, nothing other than ice. So they, so you know, necessity is a mother of invention, right? So they build their homes with ice. Uh, and the shape of that igloo is also a catenary curve. So it protects it from the blizzards, the strong blizzards that blow. But then, you know, what would it mean to stay in a house of ice? Isn't it cold? But there's ice everywhere, right? So it doesn't matter whether you are inside or outside. Would it matter? It's ice outside, ice inside. So it's like staying inside your big freezer, right? No. It's not ice. You've learned the story of Goldilocks, right? In your childhood? Goldilocks eats that kir, which is at the right temperature, right? Neither warm nor cold. That's called the famous Goldilocks principle. So Inuits have learned that you need to collect the snow, okay, in a powder form. And there is a right amount of powderiness in it, which is neither very much powder, nor, so then you need some binding, because it has to stand, it has to bind, so it should stand the forces of the winds, but it is sufficiently porous, which traps a lot of air. 
In fact, powdered snow is 95% air, trapped air. So this igloo is built out of trapped air, thermodynamics coming in now, okay? It's trapped air, and that's why it's an insulator. So it actually traps the heat that is generated within. Your body is a furnace, it generates heat, but this igloo will trap it. It will not let it go out. So the difference inside and outside igloo can be, human beings are saying that, in fact I have seen a video of, you know, uh, a three-year-old child running naked inside the igloo. Okay? So you can imagine, you know, a child in the polar region running naked inside the igloo. So the difference in inside and outside could be easily 45 to 50 degrees. That's huge, without any electricity. So you just put a candle and the body heat. And I think igloo is a place where the more the more the merrier, right? So it's good to have party because more people generate more heat and it's all trapped. And and you know the design is very specific. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this. So the living area is slightly elevated. So because the cold air is heavier than the warm air. So warm air rises, they stay slightly higher where it's warmer, and the cold air escapes from the bottom. And uh, but so that's the you know thermodynamics of and of course there's the melting so these walls of the igloo they slightly melt and then again refreeze so it sort of bonds and the traditional igloos are made not by you know putting together the, they are actually cut from the uh, freshly fallen snow which is sufficiently dense and porous enough so it has the right balance the golden of principle okay let's move on the iconic apple tower it's a perfect amalgamation of economy power and engineering. And it's a proof that these three requirements need not be divorced from each other. Today is one of the greatest uh, tourist attraction. But do you know what it was, how it was perceived? And it was, by the way, a result of a design competition. Architectural design competition with Gustav Eiffel one hands down. You know? So some of the greatest art critics had this to say about the Eiffel Tower. This bell fry skeleton. Okay. This mass of iron gymnasium apparatus, incomplete, confused and deformed. A half-built factory pipe, a caracas waiting to be flashed down with three stone or brick. A funnel-shaped grill, a whole riddled suppository. These were some of the greatest art critics. He said, is this art? Is this beautiful? What this guy is up to? You know? But Gustav was not the one to be let down by such strong criticism. He responded. And to me, that's the most beautiful and articulated response of an engineer, I think, who knew his art better than the artist. And I think I, that there is a part A, right? Steam is S T E A M. So this is that A. So Gustav Eiffel said, you know, for my part, I believe that the tower possesses its own beauty. I need to believe that because one is an engineer, one is not preoccupied by beauty in one's constructions or that one does not seek to create elegance as well as solidity and durability. It means that, you know, and he just can be artist as well, you know. Is it not true that the very conditions which you spread also conform to the hidden rules of harmony? I'll just give a hint. I don't know how many of you have read Ayn Rand, uh, the, the philosopher novelist of the 20th century. Very strong. Uh, you should read her novels, you know. At last shot and found in head. <coughs> now, to what phenomena did I have to give primary concern in designing the tower? We must bear in mind that that fellow was going to design a tower 370 meter tall with 125 meter square base. It was not a painting of a tower to be hanged inside a living room. Okay? It had to contend with the forces of gravity and winds and cyclones and earthquakes. Okay? So that's why, you know, <laughs> an engineer has to design it, right? Now to what phenomena did I have to give primary concern in designing the tower? It was wind resistance. Well, then I hold that the curvature of the monument's four outer edges, which is as mathematical calculation dictated it should be, will give a great impression of strength and beauty, for it will reveal to the eyes of observer the boldness of design as a whole. Okay. Likewise, the many empty spaces built into the very elements of construction will clearly display the constant concern not to submit any unnecessary surfaces the violent action of hurricanes. If you and me would have designed, we would have designed the facade with continuous structure, right? But then, you give a surface to the wind, and the wind will take the tower along with it. So he has made the tower full of holes. So wind just blows, does not, tower does not take it, you know, it just blows through. It's 1885 or something when it was constructed. Moreover, there's an attraction in the colossal. 
and the singular delight to which ordinary theories of art are scarcely applicable. So don't be limited by the notions of art that you know the conventional paradigm experiments teach you. You must challenge them. Okay? And when you challenge them, you create something like this. You create new paradigms. Ethel Tower's beauty is deeper and subtler than steam the participant perception of external form. It was an engineering model confirming the structural principles of economic strength and durability. Okay? Uh, let me give you the proof that it's an engineering marvel of economic strength and durability. So, so this is 324 meter tall and the square base is 125 meter. Now if you were to melt the entire iron of Ethel Tower and turn it into a ball, what would be the size of that ball? Diameter of the 325 meter tall and 125 meter square base. You'll be surprised. It will be a ball of 12 meter diameter. You can actually put it inside, you know, the slightly bigger room. Entire Eiffel Tower can be packed inside the room. That's the ultimate proof of economy. Okay. And here is a simple calculation. Here is the source. You can go through it. The slide you can load it. I don't want to have the time right now. No, it is incredibly light. If you weigh a cylinder of air that encompasses the Eiffel Tower, in a Taraju with acid tower on one side and a cylinder of air on the other, which one will be heavier? You will be amazed. The uh, acid tower weighs 7,300 tons and the cylinder of air will weigh 9,540 uh, tons. That is serious engineering, okay? And this is the simple math. I mean, it's just volume and mass calculation with density. Durability. Eiffel Tower in 2020 gives no proof of durability. Okay? Now, there are two elements or two aspects to Eiffel Tower's construction. A, it's a crisscross structure full of holes. And B, the shape. So the shape is dictated by the fact that it has to contend with the torque due to gravity and torque due to the wind. So, in calculated the right shape, which can you know lead to restoring forces uh, due to the actions of this gravity and wind forces. So, what is the right shape so that the combined torque flows down the legs? Okay. So that shape is calculated using fluid dynamics and the other things. Okay. So it's a perfectly. So you see, a lot of branches are coming together. It's not just that you know you do be civil and you know I mean so you need to know math, you need to know civil engineering, and core engineering has some of the greatest challenges. Okay. So it transfers the weight from where you don't want to where you want it. See the same thing, the arch transfers the weight from where you don't want to where you want to have it. Now you will be amazed to know that the inspiration from this actually came from biology. So this the story goes back even before Gustav Eiffel. There was this amazing German engineer who designed amazing cranes. The designs of modern designs of cranes owed to Professor Kahneman of Germany. He had a biologist and an anatomist friend, Mayer. So once he went to the dissection room, and Mayer showed him the cross section of the femur, the thigh bone. And he was like, he said, This is my brain. He said, What are you telling? This is the cross section of the femur, the thigh bone. He said, No, but man, this, look at this crisscross, you know. He said, I am a, I mean, I do this graphic static, so I, so whenever a body is stressed with a lot of forces, we find out the uh, the lines of forces, you know, the stresses and strains, how do they flow within a body? And I do this graphic statics, and the lines that I draw for a train look exactly like how. So nature is an engineer, it does that. Over the years, millions of years, it has perfected this art of putting material where you want it, and not where you don't want it. So bones are strong and light. Amazing, right? You don't want heavy, uh, nature has not made bone solid stuff, you know. It's very granular. So, uh, how did it go into the, uh, let me not get into that right now, we don't have much of time. But here is the secret to the bone strength. A bone, so this is not biology, bones have two parts. There is an outer compact bone and there is a spongy inner part. The compact bone, so you see one, one striking thing that you saw in the Eiffel Tower and the bone is that both of them have a fractal structure. What is a fractal? Fractal is an object where, you know, the hierarchy of scales, it's a self-similar object. 
the structures repeat at every single length scale. And same is true with the bone. You know, with this outer compact bone which is hard, it's like a baguette. To eat this baguette, this French bread baguette, so it's hard from outside and soft from inside. So hard outer pipe part helps you lift stuff, but then you also do pushes and pulls, right? So it takes the, the stresses to pushes and pulls. So this inner soft part has this uh, crisscross structure, okay? And the outer hard part has the fractalist structure. So there are this uh, things called osteons, and this oste the central part called Heversen kettle where the blood vessels go. And this osteons, if you look at, we are again, you know, made up of a uh, lot of uh, bundles of fibers. If you look at the walls of osteons, they are actually fibril, collagen fibril. So they are uh, cell walls, and I mean, there is the walls inside walls inside walls. Right? So it's a structure which repeats itself. And each, each, you know, osteon, if you take a look and magnify it, it's a bundle of collagen fibrils. And if you again unpack the fibril, it's actually a bundle of three, uh, this uh, halogen, uh, tropocol, uh, tropocollagen triple helix. So your collagen uh, molecule is the most fundamental unit. So you know there are in the spectres there are the scales and this is the smallest unit in the scale. So this collagen molecules go on to make uh, triple helix. They go on to make uh, collagen fibril. The bundles of collagen fibril make an osteon and then osteons go on to make the walls. Okay, so there is a high structural hierarchy. Okay. Now, this is not the only bone. Is not the only thing that the structural hierarchy is used. Another amazing example, the bamboo. Bamboo grows to its maximum height in three months flat. So where does it get its resources to grow so fast? In three months, bamboo grows to the tallest height, okay, three months flat. And it's strong, right? We use bamboo for its strength and lightweight, right? Exactly the same principles are at work. There's an outer, harder part. And if you again dissect it, there is a structural hierarchy, fibril matrix, and the cellulose is the smallest part of a bamboo. Okay. There are a lot of interesting things that we can talk about bamboo, but right now, uh, for the short of time, we want me to go into that. So with that backdrop, let us examine the structure of agile trauma. So it has a lot of crisscross structures, right? Why did he make this crisscrosses? So again, you can see that if you take any part and blow it up, uh, it has a similarity with the larger parts. So you take this small part, blow it up, it has this crisscross, Take a smaller part, draw it up, there are crisscross. So crisscross is the smallest structural hierarchy out of which this Ethel Tower is built. And that's why you can see that it's mostly empty spaces. There are no really solid structures, right? Now, this is the iconic Howrah Bridge in Calcutta, right? And you can see that it's all crisscross, right? And in fact, if you, you know, go to any structures, you know, which are even, even in our, your uh, uh, student activity center, there are these arches, and if you look at, there are these double layer arches, and there is a triangular. Okay, so what is this thing about the crisscross? A crisscross is essentially triangles, right? So there is something about triangles that's very interesting. Okay, then you must understand. Ha, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that is again an arch, but I'm I, I know, so of course I'm talking about the crisscross structure. Uh, no, but the point is, you see, it is supported. I mean, this there is no weight here. It is supporting air on the top, right? You know, iron, right? So unless you put a skyscraper on the top of the Howrah Bridge, it's not going to top. Okay? There is no load on the top. Okay? Fine. So now, this is this, uh, in, in civil engineering, trusses are the most fundamental elements. Okay, and trusses they are an efficient mechanism to transfer load from where you don't want to where you want. Them. They are lightweight as well as they take advantage of the geometry and the laws of statics. Okay. Now, let us examine these two shapes, a square and a triangle. If I load them, which one will be more stable, a square or a triangle? Normally you might think, you know, okay, square is supported by these two, so it should be more stable and all that, blah, blah, blah. But you see, square can be deformed into a parallelogram. You cannot easily deform a triangle. Why is that? Math, simple math. Triangle is the only polygon that has a law of cosine. What do I mean by that? Each side of a triangle is uniquely determined. Given the three angles, the three sides are determined. Okay? It cannot. So if a triangle has to change, let me, if a triangle has to change its 
changes the shape from here to like this, one of this length has to compress and the other side has to elongate. So that's asking for a lot. If I ask you to break a pencil, how will you do it? Right? So I say, wait, not like that. Break the pencil by pulling it, by compressing it. I'm sure Arnold and Stallone will struggle and won't succeed, right? You cannot pull a pencil like because that's a, you know, laws of statics tell that if you can transfer the loads into the compressive and tensile, you know, instead of shears, then that helps. Because it's hard to break a pencil. Even a pencil cannot be broken, but this is easy. Okay, so triangle, if it has to deform, one length has to elongate, another has to compress. That's the only way it can deform. But the angles will change, right? And that requires enormous force. So the forces on triangle will be immediately transferred into compressive and tensile forces. That's hard to do. I mean, that, okay, please, don't think that you will take a degree in civil engineering from this unit lecture, okay? There is a lot more and there are experts sitting here, okay? There's, there is a lot more, okay? that's why people do a four-year degree, okay? What I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, I mean, what are the basic elements and if you really look at it, the reasons often are rather simple. But of course, then there are more complications when you address those complications, okay? So, triangle is the only polygon that has the law of cosine. And the law of statics tells that, you know, you have, uh, it can be shown that the body is loaded at two points only. The resultant forces at these two points are equal in magnitude, <coughs> opposite in direction, and act along the line joining between the two points. Can you see that? Why? Because you are looking at laws of statics. If they are not equal in magnitude, there is a net force, it will translate. Right? If they are not in along the line joining the two things, then it will result in a torque, it will rotate. Right? So laws of statics. And that's why, you know, a pencil is very hard to want statics. It's very hard to break like that. Okay. And if you put a, a beam and load it from the center, then, you know, uh, then it's going to break. Uh, but if you try to come, turn it into a tensile and compression forces, then it will be static. Now, you know, actually, okay, I have not had a time to change this slide. So every time, you know, I give this talk, I try and think of some problems which we are grappling with and I throw open this problem to students and sometimes students take them very seriously and make my life difficult because then they come and bug me. I thought that if I tell the problem they will work on it and forget me but then they keep bugging me. So, you know, one of the problems that I always had is with the design of a toilet flush. We have this mod modern toilet flush, right? Like this 12, 15 liter tanks, you flush it one time. It is beyond my understanding that whoever designed it why do we need such tanks? In the good old times, we had this analog. Analog meaning continuous. You know, you can open the tap as much as you want and close it. Right? But now, you know, even if you want to throw 5 liters of or 2 liters of water, the flush is digital. Either you don't flush or you flush 15 liters. And after it is flushed, and if you want to flush immediately again, then you again wait for 5 minutes until it fills. I mean, why can't we just have a, you know, regular this thing? So, um, digital, I mean, this is my terminal, digital versus analog. Then, you know, we have these air conditioners which use this um, insulating pipes. We have this uh, split AC, where the AC is somewhere else, and there is this uh, pipe through which the cold air flows, and you want to stop the dissipation, so you put it with the insulation. Okay. Somebody has to design the same thing for the water pipes. In Pilani, we have water from the tank. So we have a perfect mechanism for hot water in summer and cold water in winter. Because in summer it goes to 50 degrees. The tank is hot, the water is hot, the pipe is of iron. Okay, it heats up and often we just want to wash our hands. We want to use 200 ml of water. But there is 5 liters of water in the pipe. So you keep it open for 5 minutes until 5 liters of water, hot water goes so that you don't burn your hand. And then you use 200 ml to drain me. And in winter, you have another amazing issue that the water is so cold. You want to drink it, but you cannot because or you want to wash your hands, but you will freeze your bones. Okay. So you again wait for the water from the pipe to go, 5 liters go, then you have 50 ml and then again close it. So these are, I think, you know, we need to come up with designs 
Another thing, you know, why why can't we have you know houses with modular windows and roofing which is modular? For example, you know, design. I mean, this is for you future houses. Okay, design a roofing where which is modular, which can be changed. So you can have a shiny layer on the top, which reflects the sunlight into the back to the sun. We don't want too much of sunlight in summer, but in winter uh, it can be inverted and there can be more a dark layer which can. Uh, catch more sunlight and warms your house. So you can have windows which can also, you know, you can have a shiny outer layer so that it does not serve as a greenhouse. And uh, so, you know, I think we need to think about those things. Another problem that I suggested last time was that, you know, we have this grey water recycling systems, which are huge uh, mammoth uh, <coughs> machines. Can we come up with a modular design, you know, which can be installed in a small bathroom? I take a shower, my water is stored. And then you know there is a small water which, uh, and then there is a small modular recycling machine which can uh, recycle. Shower water is mostly fine, right? I mean there is just chemicals of soap and maybe a little bit of my sweat and dirt. That's it. So it can be used to flush the toilet. We are today flushing our toilet with the well water, right? Which is like gorpa. When the water is, you know, we are running out in wells and we are flushing the toilet. With it. So please, you know, think about this. One student is working with me on this grey water recycling. He took it very seriously. And last two semesters, he is making my life hell. But so I also decided to make his life hell. I said, okay, you now you design one system. We are trying to do something, and uh, maybe he uh, is now working hard before he graduates. Uh, hopefully, something will be done. But uh, I am not an engineer. You know, I, it is only out of concern. I will be happy to mentor you, some of you take things up. But it is your thought, your idea. You take the credit and go ahead and become an entrepreneur. Okay. So I will stop here. I think I will just, before I stop, let me. Uh, Summarize because this is my last lecture. I will take one extra class after the midterm is over. So, what was it all about? This lecture was not intended to explain the physics of engineering as much as it was about inspiring design principles. Often, ultimate design principles draw inspiration from math, physics, biology, and various other branches of science and engineering. It is very important to have questions in mind and approach every subject in the pursuit of those answers. You did not start with get questions, but you can work them from the answers you get and constantly refine them. Answers have a way of happening to you, when and where you least expect to find them. If you approach every subject with openness, for example, you know this problem of bead sliding. Whoever thought that, you know, this will end up inventing calculus, right? <coughs> if you approach every subject with openness and are willing to learn something, then as Steve Jobs has famously put, you never know when you connect the dots backwards. And these are my uh, I'll just take one slide to explain my teaching learning. You know, I can only explain it to you. This is a note from my diary. I maintain a diary regularly. So these are just some thoughts from my diary. I can only explain it to you and not necessarily make you understand things. For my explanation, it's only a story of how I have made sense of things. To understand, you must make sense of things yourself. Experience it directly yourself. It is possible that in your quest for understanding, you are almost there. In which case, under what circumstances my explanation will help if you are almost there. Okay. In which case my explanation may help you pass the penultimate layer of understanding. <coughs> Not to forget, this assumes that I have made sense of things and you are almost there. Both are questionable assumptions. Either I have made sense of things, nor you are almost there. Okay. Does it prove the futility of teaching in the process of learning? Not in the least. It only shows how grossly misunderstood is this thing called understanding and our take on teaching learning. I believe that understanding is the least understood word. Good teaching is not as much about explaining as much as it is about inspiring. The only way to inspire is to recount a personal story of the discovery of understanding. Like all these examples over the years, you know, I have tried and understand things. So I put it together. So it's a personal story. Okay, it's not a lecture which is like taken from somewhere, it's a personal story. But teaching is not as much about explaining as much as it is about inspiring. The only way to inspire is to recount the personal story of the discovery of understanding or whatever you make of it. Such a teaching is not a guided tour to adventure climb to the summit, but only a snapshot of the view from the summit and an account of how the teacher made it. If the account is a true story of personal experience, it will inspire a climb. I do hope that you all continue your climb. Thank you so very much. And, uh, and waves. Okay? Yeah. Thank you so much.
know very much for your patience. Yeah. Uh, I must uh, also mention that, you know, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, I was talking to uh, Professor Barai, and sometime I was talking to Professor Bhattacharya, and I spoke about this approach to teaching, and they said that they would like to sometime, you know, uh, walk into the classroom and see what's, what is this whole paradigm all about. So I invited them, and I'm so happy that they accepted the invitation and be a part of today's class, and uh, I'll be very happy to learn from their critical feedback. Thank you so much, Mr. Yaw, for your presence and inspiring presence. Thank you.